Curtis. If you got one of the flyers, you'll notice that it has my picture, I'm sorry, but it also has my name. And I know there's at least a few of you that have gone, you misspelled his name. No, my mama did that to me. Um, my mom had a third grade education. She spelled phonetically. My dad didn't want to have anything to do with spelling the name. My Uncle George helped my mom, who didn't have much of, more of an education. She promises she took the name out of the book. Now, my name is Wayne. W-A-Y-N-E is how you normally spell that, but my mom spelled it W-Y-A-N-E. When I was 15 years old, I was filling out my driver's license application. The driver's license instructor said, you got to fill it out exactly like it is on your birth certificate. I pull out my birth certificate, and I look at it, and I go, Mom, is my name spelled W-Y-A-N-E? She said, yes. I said, nobody spells their name that way. She said, you do. I went through a registration line once at Lubbock Christian, and I'm going through there, and, I'm, and this is back before computers, back, you know, in, in the days of abacus and parchment. And uh, so I, I'm filling out all my paperwork, and, and I sign my name to the paperwork, and I give it to the financial aid person, and she types, and she types, and then she stops, and she looks over, and she looks back at what she typed. She looks back, and so she starts erasing it, and I said, what are you doing? She said, you misspelled your name. I said, I did what? She said, you misspelled your name. I said, no, I didn't. I spelled my name right. For the next 10 minutes, we had a conversation. I had to call somebody over that like ran the place and said, this woman does not understand how I spell my name. My name is W-Y-A-N-E. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> just kind of the way it is. And uh, it's become a great conversation piece over many, many years. Uh, we may revisit that subject down the road. Uh, Back in the day, long before um, instant communication, a man lived on Long Island, and he purchased for himself a beautiful new barometer. You know what the barometer is. Barometer is that instrument that measures the barometric pressure. The weather is affected by that. And, and he bought the barometer and he took it home and he took it out of the box and it was on a, a day that had broken clouds and you could see the blue sky above it and when he pulled the barometer out he looked at it and the needle was pointing toward the word stormy well he shakes the barometer he wonders what the problem is he kind of taps it on the back and the needle doesn't move so finally he he decides that he's bought something defective and that really bothers him because it was expensive. So he sits down at his desk because cell phones weren't invented and he couldn't text. And he writes out this letter, this scathing letter. I, you, I have bought an effective instrument. Your manufacturing business stinks, you know, or something like that. Stuffs it in the envelope. The next morning he gets up and he goes to the mail, uh, mailbox and he drops it in the mailbox and he goes to work on Long Island and when he came home that night the barometer was missing as well as the rest of his house which blew away in the storm. Well, trust is something that we practice every day of our lives. Now, if you don't believe me, Find the nearest state highway that's got two lanes and you've got a broken line that's right down the middle of it. And you drive 65 and up on this broken line with semi-trucks coming right at you. And you don't even think about it. You're just driving along and these trucks are whizzing by. Why would a little white line broken or yellow line broken in the middle of the road why would we trust it so much? Seems like it'd be pretty scary to me. You know, sometimes we get into this large metal tube and we will, we will sit in this large metal tube and we'll strap ourselves into it. And it, it, the, with the wings out, it will roll down the runway. You've never met the pilot before. You don't know what kind of a person this is. And it will fly up into the air and you'll fall asleep because you trust. You've never been on this plane before. You've never met the pilot. You don't know if you're going in the right direction or not. 
Why do you do that? Because you've learned to trust some things. We can read a two, and this is meddling now, and I understand this, but we can read a two-sentence uh, report on social media, and it can change the way we think about somebody. Even though we don't know the person who wrote the two, letter, two sentences, we don't know the source that they have. Ah, but that's too close. Move on to something else. Listen, why do we give our trust to anything? Why do we become trustworthy people? Well, we honestly base our trust on what we perceive to be trustworthy. Maybe it's a track record. Maybe we've seen something over and over again, and we, we know that person or that thing is something that is proven over and over again they're trustworthy, so we trust them. We put our money in a bank that is proven over and over again that nobody's suing it, and they keep our money. And we decide to put our money there because we, we believe that bank has integrity, and we trust it. But what happens when trust is violated? What happens when the bank that we just put our money in is forced to close? What happens when the company that we went all the way across the country, moved our family, and that company falls apart? What happens to us? What, what happens when the spouse that we married and we stood before the Lord and we said I give you my life and I will always be faithful to you and they didn't keep their end of the bargain trust can be devastated like that and believe me shattered trust is hard to restore in this message I want to continue following after the question why trust God and I want to talk about God's integrity about God's track record, about how God proves himself over and over and over and over again that he is worthy to be trusted. Because there's a lot of people, and maybe, by the way, you're one of them. Maybe you're at that brink today where you're about ready to walk away from God because for some reason you believe that God has not been trustworthy or that the people of God have not been trustworthy. I'm here to tell you that you can trust God. And I want to talk about why from the Scripture today. You see, a lot of people have a negative experience they perceive with God. A lot of people ask God to take care of their sickness or they take care of their loved one or to, to help somebody that, that's in trouble. And that didn't always work out. And we have a tendency to believe that God did that and some agnostic, some atheist tells you that God's not worth following and we, they give you a lot of different things and you're going, oh, maybe they're right. Listen, I'm not going to be able to address all the compelling objections that are out there to God's integrity. So today I want to go a little bit different route. I want us to point toward the scriptures today and I want to make a challenge to us all. If the story is consistent, if the message is coherent, if the promises of God always come true, you can trust Him. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, and like I said, the first class and this class are all very helicopter oriented. We're going to get way above the Scriptures. And today we're really going to get on our horse. And we're going to start in the beginning and we're going to go from there but we're going to try to narrow it down, and you'll see where we're going to go in just a second. So here we go. We started in the beginning last time. Well, I kind of want to start in the beginning this time. But there is one central promise that is true in the Scripture. It started in the Garden of Eden, and it carries all the way through. God knows that man pulls himself away, and God loves man. And he wants to restore man to himself. And so here we go. This is how this unfolds. God creates the perfect connection and relationship between man and God in the Garden of Eden. And he, he tells man that his creation is perfect and it's beautiful and that he is going to walk with him. And they do. They walk directly with God. But then something happens. There is a, a serpent, I believe to be Satan, and he is the one who 
approaches the, the man and the woman because they were both there together. And he says, look, I know he says that you can't eat of that tree right over there, but it's not going to be a problem because don't you want to be like God? The man and the woman are pulled from that because they do want to be their own God. See, that's the root sin. That's the root sin for all mankind from the beginning. We want to be our own God. Well, God intervenes and God puts the man and the woman into a, a mode in the world where they are going to be living with their sin and the results of their sin. But He turns His attention immediately to the serpent. And this is what he says to the serpent. He says to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3 verse 15. So, from that point forward begins this, this unfolding process where God has made a promise. But that promise isn't going to be fulfilled for thousands of years. And this is how it went. Men, because of their sinfulness, pursued their own desires to the point where just about the whole world had turned away from God. But God chose His one family, the family of Noah, to preserve mankind because God's promise to man that He would be restoring man to Himself had not yet taken place. Then God sets up a people of promise through the seed of Abraham. Generations of Abraham's descendants come and go. Faithfulness for this new nation is a moving target. Yet God still loves this people and He protects this people. He lifts up Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph, to become powerful in Egypt. God's people are protected and God's people are provided for in Egypt. And they have a place of great honor among the Egyptian people until that Pharaoh dies. And then comes a Pharaoh that does not hold to honoring these people. And as a result, these Jewish people are enslaved. Fast forward 400 plus years and God approaches Moses. Moses' story goes from being a Jewish slave to being raised in Pharaoh's household to being sent back in Midian to become a shepherd again because he had committed manslaughter in Egypt and he was fearful for his life and God comes to him in the burning bush and he says, I'm sending you back. I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And God sent plagues and, and it made Pharaoh bitter. Then finally, cause of the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh sends the people out. Moses takes them across the Red Sea. Pharaoh is defeated, and the people are now wandering in the wilderness, and they come to the mountain where Moses is given God's law. And as he's given God's law, that law is meant to train the people. To train the people to be like God wants them to be. To train the people to be God's choice so that they can be an example to the world around them that God is greater than any other God. And, it, and based on ten foundational commands, this law reflected the heart the people were supposed to have toward their God and toward one another. The idea was that the people would put their full trust in God. They would learn to do whatever He asked them to do. And they would follow Him wherever He led them. And He did lead them. He led them with a, a pillar of fire, uh, at night, a cloud in the daytime, and he gave them clothes that didn't wear out, and shoes that didn't wear out. He gave them manna from heaven and quail, and they walked through this wilderness. But after a while, while Moses is on the mountain receiving this law, they finally get very impatient. And they push against it. And they say, where is Moses? That eventually becomes, where is God? And they begin demonstrating a lack of trust in God and they decide they're going to need to go back to Egypt and they build these, uh, this idol, this golden calf because they didn't trust God. 
That generation was not allowed to experience God's promised land because they kept pushing God away. But the following generation was allowed into the promised land, but even that generation didn't do what God asked them to do. He said, drive all the inhabitants out of the land, but they didn't, and their gods infected the people. And they began worshiping false gods. And all this time, God is faithful. He's faithful to the promise that He's going to restore humanity back to Himself, even if these people aren't cooperating. We're going to pick up the story right there in just a moment. But I want to sing this song with you. I love this old song. It's called Ancient Words. It's not really that old. It's really a fairly new song. How many of you know Ancient Words? Oh, this will be fun. Okay. This song is not hard to learn. But I want you to pay attention to the song. I want you to pay attention to what it's being said. And if I'm a soloist up here, I'll do my best. But I'd like for you to sing this with me. Song goes like this. Mm, holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope. In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true. Changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice oh heed the faithful words of christ holy words long preserved for our walk in this world they resound with god's own heart oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts Oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Amen. So, God sent judges, then he sent prophets, then he sent kings, then he sent more prophets, <laughs> who told the people over and over again that God wanted the people to seek him. God wanted the people to be faithful to him. God would allow the enemies to come and they would defeat his people. He would allow these enemies to inhabit their lands he would allow these people to be defeated. He would allow these people to go into further slavery all because he wanted them to call on him. And these people got caught up in a cycle of rebellion. God would warn them. They would reject him. They would be defeated or enslaved. They would finally cry out to God for relief. 
God would send help and restoration. Wash, rinse, repeat over and over again. But all the while, all the while this was going on, God would send his prophets, and the prophets would drop these little nuggets to the people. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And then... In Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call Him Emmanuel. We save these for Christmas time for some reason. That word literally means God with us and God promises that God will be with these people. And then in Micah 5, verse 2, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will become one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Then my favorite, because it harkens to my favorite scene in Scripture, and that is Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom from the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. The people would constantly prove themselves to be inconsistent, selfish, rebellious, stubborn. Even so, the promises of God never wavered, even though the people constantly faltered. The promises of God were always involved in the history of Israel. And Israel, when they faced their enemies, they were always small. They were always smaller than their enemies. And then, along the way, there was this big civil war that divided the country even more. And the northern kingdom was taken off into captivity by Assyria because they constantly turned to idols and they would not call on the name of the Lord. And that group of people never came back. But there was this pocket of people down below in Judah. In the city of Jerusalem was the place of promise. And they did idol worship too. And they did, but yet God didn't send them off into captivity forever. He did it for a while. He still wanted to get their attention. But he didn't send them away forever because he made a promise. And it was a promise that he intended to fulfill. During the interim time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 400 years and God seems to be silent. Here comes Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great and the Greeks conquer the world, we're told. And what did they bring along with them? Common language. That everyone would learn to speak and write and read eventually. And then they were eventually conquered by the Romans. And what did they bring to the table? All the infrastructure, all the roads, all the, the means of, of transportation and trade that was going to allow the promise of God to be broadcast to the entire world. They didn't mean to do that. God always had His hand in all of that. And then at the right time, this happened. Philippians 2, beginning of verse 5. Paul writes to the Philippians and he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth 
and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The promise in the garden was that He would bruise the heel of Satan. And yet Jesus, when He shows up, shows up as an infant child, a baby in Bethlehem. And Satan couldn't do anything about it. Satan ramps up the demons. And they're infesting and, and, and hurting people and doing whatever they can. And Jesus is just in total control. John tells us why. The opening of the Gospel of John, he says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word what was what? Word was God. Same was in the beginning with God. All things were created through Him, and by Him nothing wasn't created. Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Do you realize what the Bible is saying? Scripture is saying that God's promise was going to be fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus, God Himself, in the flesh who came along men, with men. The first sermon that was preached in Acts chapter 2 by Peter the Apostle, as he's talking to this group of people, these Israelites, who for generation upon generation had kept God at arm's length to the point that when he shows up as the promised Messiah, they couldn't even recognize him. Listen to what Peter says here. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is there here to this day. But he was a prophet. And he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucify, both Lord and Christ. This was so shocking to the people who were listening to this. They got it. Immediately, they got it. And they literally interrupt Peter's sermon. Because it had to be pretty incredible that whenever you hear, you know what, you killed God and he's back. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Had to be that feeling Isaiah got whenever he was in the in the <clears throat> excuse me, in the throne room of God. When he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm from a people of unclean lips. Woe is me, I'm done. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, and you shall receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. Listen, all I've done today is just scratch the surface. The truth is, the promises of God about defeating Satan, the restoration of the creation, can be traced for thousands of years through every section of Scripture, every page, just about you can find promise on it. God's Word to men has always been in front of us. Generations of philosophers have tried to explain it away. People have long tried to disprove it. They've tried to find loopholes in it. They've tried to dismiss it as too fantastic, too frivolous to be believed. 
But those who dismiss this as untrue only do so because they don't want to believe it. You see, there's a lot of evidence that what is being said is true. There are eyewitnesses about on top of eyewitnesses. There is history upon history. And what's really amazing is that there were eyewitness accounts of Jesus in the 40 days after He was resurrected, walking around on the earth. You know, if they wanted to show that He wasn't resurrected, all they had to do was pull out the body. Or they could, they could take Him who was walking freely among men and say, this can't be the guy. But He was seen by 500 people at a time. And then these eyewitness accounts are written down for us all. And they're written down in such a way that, that they don't have any problem not only uh, collaborating with each other, or not collaborating, corroborating each other, there's the word. They're not, they're not just corroborating each other. They're not contradicting each other. And the message is so life-changing that we have gone from that day all the way through to today, and entire nations have been affected by the resurrected Jesus Christ. Does God have integrity? Oh my goodness. You know what? If you want to trust God, though, you've got to answer that question. And you've got to answer it in the affirmative if you really want to trust God. Because if God makes promises that He cannot keep, or He will not keep, or if he doesn't follow through, you cannot trust him. And if he doesn't have the full power to make his promises come true, you cannot trust him. But, if you can trust him, God promises that Satan is defeated. God promises that his people are brought near to him. God promises salvation. God promises new life for those who trust in his provision of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and in the fact that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. God promises also that when we are baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, we do so for the forgiveness of our sins and we also receive the gift of His presence in our life. Holy Spirit, as He dwells in us, and that Holy Spirit, as we read through the New Testament, gives us talents and gifts, and He intervenes and He intercedes, and we have hope, sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. What is absolutely amazing is that I've only shared one promise during this sermon today. Because there's promise of God answering our prayers. There's promise of God giving us gifts to use in His kingdom. There's promise of how God can intervene and bless our relationships where we could be married for 43 or 53 or 63. Ran into somebody the other day that's been married for 74 years. You see, God invites us to test this stuff. He wants you to test Him. He wants you to put whether or not He is faithful to you to the test. He wants you to give your life to Him. So that, just like you get into the big metal tube and you fall asleep, you can get into the arms of God and know that there's nothing to fear. No reason to hide. So do you want to put God's promises to the test today? Don't let people fool you with paper reasoning and cardboard logic that they're going to use to tell you that God is not real or somehow powerless or inconsistent. On the contrary, if you are willing to put God to the test, I have no doubt that He will prove Himself to you over and over again. Because faith is being sure of what we hope for. And it's being certain of what we do not see. Or as the King James says, it's the evidence of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Pray with me. Our Lord, our God,
To you we bow. You are the God of promise. You are the God of hope. You are the resurrected God. You send us yourself. You've sent us your word. You've sent us all we need for life and godliness. Lord, even though there's a lot of saber rattling in the, around the world, even though Satan has the attention of so many who do not want us to believe that you are trustworthy, let us let you prove it. Let us have faith in you and your word, faith in your son, faith in the promise. Let us humble ourselves before you so that you can lift us up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing in just a moment. Some of you may not have been putting your trust in God. Some of you may have kept Him at arm's length. Maybe you haven't accepted the fact that God's promise is for you. Or maybe you've allowed what's happened in other people's lives to dictate how you feel about God instead of really putting God to the test for yourself. I promise, this God who can keep a promise for thousands and thousands of years can keep His promises in your life. If you need us to pray with you, if you would like to give your life to God in the first place, please come and let us enjoy that moment with you because this is a day for decisions. We want you to honor God by trusting in Him today. And if you'd like to just talk to someone after this is over, come see me, talk to Curtis, tap someone on the shoulder. Let's enjoy this moment together. Let's all stand and sing.